Let's see if we can get 511 up. Okay. So here's the data. We got some negative predicted values as well. Ah, uh, there you go. Negative five, I see. Negative five. Okay. Yes. So that's kind of a problem. You got negative predicted values. Okay. How did you get negative W's? If I told, if I suggested putting uh, the uh, S squared, these are the one over W's, right? right. Those are all positive. Right. Okay. So did that did weighted least squares help at all getting negatives in the, in the predictive? One of those. I can see what formula you're using there. Okay. Yeah, cool. That's right. Okay. We could also calculate for lack of fit because we have repeated values, right? So SSPE you could actually calculate, right? Well, let's just go ahead and do a lack of fit for the. Uh, let's do a lack of fit analysis, right? So what's <laughs> equals? Let's see, I need two times the SI squared because each of them has two degrees of freedom to get SS pure error. Okay. Uh, Oops. Just click on the one you already did. I forgot the two. I forgot the equals. Yeah, okay. That's harder for me. <laughs> okay. See you know what I'm talking about, about lack of fit? Right. I'm doing this in a clumsy way. Probably easier just to delete things. Actually, it's a lot easier to do something else. Just take the sum of those things and multiply by two. Oh, well. I'll just go ahead and do this. So. What will I do to calculate SSPE? At the pure error. Um, You're going to have to do lack of fit, right? Isn't it just the, the sum of all those? Yes. Okay, so S is pure error would be the sum of all these. Okay equals sum of all those. Okay, does that look right? One and seven, nine, eleven, yeah, that looks about right. Okay, so that's the sum, that's the SS pure error. Okay, so now the SS res, which is 8863, okay, it's huge, right? So there's a, there's a gigantic lack of fit. Does everybody see that? Because, so this is SSPE. And therefore, now I'm going to partition, no, therefore SSLOF, okay, is the remaining part of SSRES. So that equals this number right here minus that little number right there. equals 8845. And how many degrees of freedom? DF. This one had, I've uh, got two for each of these cases, a 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. So there's a huge number of degrees of freedom for pure error. 16. All right? And then let's see, the total degrees of freedom were 19, residual degrees of freedom were 19, excuse me, so this is 19 minus 16. Equals three. So I'm going to divide in my in my F statistic. I'm going to get uh, the number the the uh, sum of squares for lack of fit divided by three. Okay, equals this number divided by three, all divided by. Uh, 
Oops, sorry, I made a mistake. All divided by that number divided by 16. Okay? And you're getting on that statistic about 2,700. Well, that's a slight lack of fit. Okay? <laughs> okay. So, does everybody see that? So that. Uh, so that the linear model is certainly not adequate, um, and so we're going to have to add more terms in. That's why I stuck in these interaction terms, x1, x2, and so on and so forth. The problem is you can't throw them all in because then uh, x prime x is not invertible. Okay, so in other words, the columns are linearly dependent. <laughs> you get 11 of them going there. Okay, I think you can only get uh, eight linearly independent columns. Okay, that makes kind of sense, doesn't it? Because, because there's only eight uh, levels. Okay, there's only eight levels. So there will be only, at most, eight level independent. I need the column of ones, so that would give me only three interaction terms that I can throw in. All right, that'll cover everything. So... But then are we just, like, throwing in so many terms that we're sure to get yeah, you should get a good fit. <laughs> you should get something. Okay. But uh, you'll see that the interaction terms are necessary. Okay. So this is that business. What about the weighted least squares? Did you get it to work? I got one to work. I thought I was doing it right. I don't know. Now I'm walking. Okay, what do you do? You take these are the inverse weights, right? The variances are the inverse weights. Okay, so the W column, I need a W. I need a square root of W. Let's put in a W. Okay. The W is one is one over uh, this business. Okay. So I'm just going to not even bother with the linear regression part C. I'm just going to take this the way I suggested doing it. Uh, that's a little bit crummy because you see the variance did. I mean, the ver there is some variability in the variances. Okay. We got one sample variance worthy here of 2.8, and the other ones were uh, a little around one. There were some small ones. Okay, so what? All right, so there's some variability in the variances. That's a problem. So that you do probably want to do part C of this problem to get a nice, uh, to use more information than just these individual weights. Okay? If there had been like eight or ten observations per, uh, level, then I wouldn't even bother. But since there's only three, then I might want to uh, do part C of 511, okay, which was to fit some kind of model to the variances. Okay? So what are the weights? The weights are therefore 1 over. Oh, you got two equal signs. Okay, that won't work probably. 1 divided by this thing. Okay? And that's going to give me an error if I pull that down. So that's kind of a pain. Okay. Equals 1 divided by. So I have to do this thing slowly. May I just do it quickly for you? Sure. How do you do that? Control C and Control V. Okay. Oh. Oh, you want to copy the same formula, in other words? Yeah. Ah, uh, very good. Okay. Okay. No, that didn't work. Okay. So now I just need to copy this. I want to get those in all the uh, oh, well, places. Okay. We'll just make <laughs> say this one equals this one, and this one equals this one. And then what we'll do is we'll copy this. We'll paste it here, paste it here, paste it here. Now the little green thing in the box is telling you that it's an inconsistent formula because you're using one formula. And okay, formula you're good at heat, man. He is fast with Excel. Okay, oh. <laughs> I love that. It escaped. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I wish I had him working on my homework. Okay, let's see. Okay, so those are the weights. All right, now I can easily get <laughs> the square root of W. All right, equals, that I could do myself, okay. And 
there you get those. Okay. So now you have to multiply the square root of w times x1. This is kind of a long process, okay? So let's just see what's coming out. Equals this times that. Okay, that's pretty easy. Etc. Any comments or questions at this point? And actually, I could just drag this thing across, right? Well, you have to reference, it's all going to be times the square root of w, right? That's true, so I have to reference the square root of w, yeah, darn it. You have to reference that. So click there, go up to the t, and hit f4 twice. Okay. Oh, sorry, three times, hit it again. Okay, then i got to drag it down again. And then you got to drag it down. Oh. You, That's not going to work. You, you clicked on the wrong cell. Yeah, click on the t cell again, on the square root cell. Now hit F4 three times. Okay, now hit... They didn't hit it three times. They didn't do anything. Okay, now drag that down. Okay, that only froze... Let's see, what did that freeze? Yeah, that that froze the T. Hole. That's good. That's what I want. Why did you hit me three times then? Well, because it cycles through. First it freezes the whole cell, then it freezes the... Oh. Then it freezes the other one. Okay, now I can pull this whole thing now over. Drag, you can highlight the whole thing and then just drag over. Okay, so that's going to give me the other two columns. Darn it. Don't give me anything. Okay. So there's the other ones. Okay. X2 prime. X3 prime. <coughs> X4 prime. Okay, we'll just call this X1 prime. What happened? x1 prime equals so that we understand what's going on. Okay? All right. There we have them. Now we can do the linear regression analysis, right? The weighted linear regression analysis. I need to put the w on the y, right? Let's put the w on the y as well. Okay. Oh, I just have to pull that over one more term. Yeah, now that I stuck. The values aren't matching up right. You okay. Click on one of the ones in x3 and just hit so we can see the formula. D2. I guess it is. What's wrong with that? Oh, well, it's just from the list of... Oh, never mind. You've got them sorted differently than I do. Okay. Never mind. I need the Ys, too, though. So, actually, I might have to keep dragging this thing all the way over. Okay. I'll just get a bunch of junk that I don't want. Okay? I'll just get a bunch of junk that I don't want. I think I... Uh, yeah, so anyway. <laughs> How far do I have to go? One more. Oh, come on. All right, one more time. Just Y prime. Okay. So, do the regression analysis. These. On, let's see. You put X range. I need to put all of these in. Square root of W corresponding to the one column, right? Okay, constant is zero. Okay, labels were included. Residuals, I guess we'll take those. Output range. Put it over here. Okay? So now what are you getting for the estimates and predicted values? Predicted value is still negative, even worse. <laughs> is that what you got? Uh, well, that's not what I got, but I, I, I used the, the V matrix and just calculated the multi inverse, but I didn't realize that I was supposed to make the term a constant. I thought I still had an intercept. Okay. So those weights are not really working very well. Okay because of the uh, strong variation, it looks like. So that's probably why part C, in order to get the predicted not negative. That's bizarre. They're all, they all look pretty, well, actually, you go up to 389. It doesn't look so great. These weights don't seem to work that well, do they? Hmm. 
Okay. Anybody else get anything close to this? Or did you just not do it? So why why is it that the intercept is zero? <laughs> David just started out. That's the, that's that's um, there should be no coefficient there. I don't know why they even put anything in there. There should be no, NA. Well, yeah, but no, well, no. I mean, why why don't we include it? Because that's not the way that it works. For uh, okay. what you're doing is you're replacing the X matrix by a U matrix. Oh, that's right. Where, it's where U is R. equal to the square root of W1 square root of WN times X. Okay, we put in these weights to account for the variance. Okay, if the, at least the variability of the residuals should be about constant. So let's plot the residuals. Let's see what happens here. <clears throat> see if we got that much part of it right. And if it didn't come out that way, then something's wrong. Okay? That doesn't look too good. <laughs> okay. So maybe we made a mistake. You got use sample variance? What do you mean? That's what I'm using. Did I make a mistake? And it looks a little better than that. It's got some clusters in it. Okay. Well, I thought this is how we were supposed to do it. One over the variance. Okay. All right, for W. Is that not correct? That's how we had it in the formula. Yeah. Square root of W is one over sigma. Okay? So um, the weighted these squares did not work out very well in this problem. Huh, that's interesting. Um, we know there's a significant lack of fit. How about if we go... Why is it, it, I've got W is the inverse of... The problem is that the, the model is just no good. You see, all of this weighted or whatever it doesn't really matter if you don't put in the interaction terms, okay? Because the model is just incorrect. In other words, the model for means is just wrong. Okay, so what I need to do is put in some interaction terms and then see what's going on. Okay, so um, um, for the estimated for beta that they have written in the book, W is not the square root; it's just one over the variance. One over the variance. Yeah. Right. That's what W is. But then when I transfer my variables, I take times the square root of W. Yeah, seven minutes. Can see the square roots in this? Well, I see this one in the B matrix, but I thought we were okay. So. I guess I went, when I calculated, I did it from the longer formula that involved all the major multiplications. So maybe it's in there and I just don't see it. Okay. Let's try putting the full regression. Let's just do one thing. Let's go ahead and regress Y on all the way through, um, these, including these three interaction terms, and see what happens. Okay? So let's do one more regression. <clears throat> First, for the... Uh, model with uh, no adjustment for weights, okay? So for, first put in your Y column, okay? Then put in um, all of these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven columns here for your X's, okay? Constant is not zero now. Labels are still in, okay. Upper range, let's put it here. Um, well, let's see, just remember we had about 8,800 for the residual sum of the squares, okay? Okay, now this residual sum of the squares is 14. Okay, <laughs> 15, okay. Let's have a look at the residuals now, uh, see if they're, what they look like. Okay, now the predicted values are, uh, let's see, how close are they? Well, let's just go ahead and copy them now. Well, you can look at, the, I mean, there's no residual, it's more than one. That's right. Well, there's one. Yeah, so in other words, basically, what is it doing? It looks like it's calculating, um, what is it actually doing? Can you tell? It's calculating Y bar, because there's too many terms. <laughs> so it's actually calculating Y bar. So all we're getting here now is pure error. Pure error, which isn't constant. Do you understand what I'm saying? Your, your estimates for y hat are y bar. This is y bar, y bar, y bar. 
white bar, white bar, white bar, and so on. So there's not too many terms, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, we could see which ones we might want to dump out, okay? Uh, the t-statistics are all big, though. Um, so, um, that's a problem, okay? So there doesn't seem to be any really great fit other than just take Y bar for this problem. Unfortunately, there's no formula. that We'd have to investigate quite a bit further to see if we can find a formula. What is the smallest uh, T statistic here? Um, I think there's a fair amount of multicollinearity in this matrix. Um, we should probably have to um, drop at least one of the terms. Okay, so uh, if you do the weight of least squares, you should probably pretty much get exactly the same thing. Okay, you want to see? So if I do weight of least squares and do the same exact regression, put it over here in the summary output. All this stuff. There were three extra variables, right? Okay. So there's eight columns. I'm not going to have a constant when I do my regression, okay? No constant this time. I'll put over here, we say, okay? There's only one degree of freedom left for error, okay? That should have been the case. Uh, let's see what happened. Oh, that was this was a bunch of old. Was this a bunch of old stuff? Wait a minute. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's still 16 degrees of freedom loss for error. Okay. Now what are you getting? I didn't put labels on those, so we're not getting any labels. Okay. Now you're not getting y bar. Now you're also getting a lot more uh, variances that are greater than one as well. Like there, there's a countable number. It's not just one, but there's. Now, in the V-matrix that they have in the book, they included the uh, constant column, whereas we didn't. There is a constant column. It's the square root of W. No, oh, I thought we just did. Okay, this is the square root of W. So I'm getting, I'm still getting eight columns in the matrix. Oh, I thought we just started at X1. No, I started here. Okay. Okay, it has got square root of W here. Okay. See that? Okay. So it's for, for pretty similar results. Okay. Um, residual sum of square is 16 now instead of uh, 14 and a half. Okay. So very similar results. Okay. You put all the interaction terms in. Now you'd want to see if you can dump one of the interaction terms out and see how much things change by. Okay? Because that's too... There's not any explanatory value of the model at all. All you're getting is Y bar. Okay? So maybe if you can get this with one interaction term, you could do partial regression plus to sort of so you see if you could figure out what it would be. Okay? You'd probably just want one interaction term. And so you'd have to guess which one it is. If I... Which has the smallest T statistic? Because it's going to be... Um, Interact. Yeah, I mean, all right. So, what is the uh, what's the has the largest t statistic here? It's x1, x3. So let's drop out x1, x2, and x1, x4. Okay, and see what happens. Let's see if you get anything decent there. Okay. <clears throat> so which one am I going to drop out? These two. Yeah. So um, I got to cut these. I got to move these things out of here. This one I just got to get out. and put it somewhere else. <laughs> I need another column. Uh, let's insert another column right here. Okay. And make it a little bit bigger. Okay. Let's cut this one out.
Okay. Is this going to change it? No, this won't mess anything up. Okay. So now I'm just going to I'm just going to add one regressor now. One more time. See what happens. The Y's. The axis. They don't need to use the one because I'm going to say with intercept, right? Okay. Well, I still have a pretty big sum of squares, it's 4,000. Um, now, x4 doesn't seem significant. I forgot whether it was before. Okay. So, x4 is not as necessary as we thought it was. Okay, I could dump x4 probably. All right. What do the residuals look like? Um, let's plot these. What happened down here? Oh, I got some extra junk. I thought I plot, plotted on the same thing. I hope this is this is just junk down here, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a good sign, huh? Let's just let have a look at the residuals. Yeah, don't look too bad. So that would be, you know, explanatory model. Okay, and then I would take out X4, probably not going to account that much. So I would just completely get rid of X4. Would you then think about now, now then I start getting in X2, see if there's interaction with X2. See if I can explain it some more. So maybe finish this problem. I don't think the weights are going to do a whole heck of a lot in this problem until you get the model right. Then you can play with the weights. Okay. Until you get the model for means right, you're not going to get anything. Okay, so there's a significant lack of fit for the, just the multiple regression model uh, with uh, without any, any interaction terms. Okay, there's a significant lack of fit. So in the weighted business isn't going to do anything. I don't know why he's messing with that. Uh, this doesn't seem to do anything. So. This is really a problem for a later chapter. Sorry I hadn't tested it out. But it's okay because we're going to talk about this stuff today anyway. Just see if you can do weightedly squares. I just want to see if you could do it. Okay? Do exactly what I did the first run. Okay? <laughs> that's all I wanted to see. If you would rather have a different problem and just not turn that one in today, that's fine. You know, I'll deal with it. Um, what do you say? Did anybody finish the problem? Do it? Somebody did. Okay. Okay. I'll just count it. I'll just count it for extra credit points today, and uh, and uh, we'll we'll make a substitute problem next week or something. Okay. I give you another problem to do. What do you say? Should you go on? Sure. Okay. All right. So yeah, that was an interesting problem. I haven't tested out. That was a new problem I'd never tested out before. I figured, well. It's a problem in the book. It looks interesting. <laughs> I think we should just build a Okay, just catapult. <laughs> yeah, it is an interesting problem, but I think it was in the wrong section. Should have been in the next chapter. Maybe it just hadn't been uh, revised. It needs to be revised. It's a, it's a decent-looking problem anyway. So everybody got to. Do you understand what's going on here now? The model for me, if it's not correct, weighted squares isn't going to do anything. So it was an excellent problem to illustrate that point. All right, it's got to be the correct model regression function before weightless squares will do anything. Then you can get the estimates that will have smaller variabilities, okay? When you do when you get it the uh, you get the optimality properties. You want to get the right so then you want to get the betas that have the smaller variabilities, okay? Okay. Let's uh, continue. We were still sort of stuck in Chapter 6.
with uh, studying measures of influence. Uh, you do have your homework. Let me get, hand it out at the break. We're going to have to quit at noon today, and we're going to switch camera people. Um, so we're going to take a little early break today. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So diagnostic measures of uh, leverage and influence. You probably didn't get one of those. And you probably didn't get this one. Okay. All right. So last time we kind of got through Cook's D, but we didn't talk about the um, the deletion fit for betas. So let's go back to let's see uh, diagnostic measures of leverage and influence exercise 612, the wine data. and have a look at that, uh, exercise 612. Before I start turning on the computer screen again, maybe I'll write a couple things on the board. Okay. All right, so what is the deletion fit for betas? Okay, and there's two indices, a J and an I. What does it mean? What I'm going to do is I'm going to define this to be the J regression coefficient, beta J hat, minus what that would be if I deleted the ith observation. Okay, from the analysis, I'd get a different beta J, presumably. Okay. Then what I want to do is I want to get this a unitless measure. How many standard errors does beta j hat change by when I delete it? Okay. Well, so that I'm going to put what is the what is the um, standard error of a beta j hat? Standard error of a beta j hat is sigma hat times uh, the square root of c j j. Okay, where c is the x prime x inverse matrix and it has the form C00, C11 down to CKK along the diagonal and then there's all these other ones. Okay? So we're assuming again that the variance is constant throughout the whole model. Uh, we are back in that situation. We're assuming the variance of epsilon equals sigma squared i. So if we're going to do this analysis, we're going to first have adjusted to that condition by weighted least squares or what have you. Cool. Okay? Okay. So that's what it is. So then I'm going to divide this thing by, uh, instead of dividing by it with the sigma hat, I'm going to use SI squared underneath the square root sign because that's the deleted estimate of sigma hat squared. All right? So. And because that, so what the square root of that is just a sigma hat except for the deletion factor. All right? And there is a formula for SI squared in the book using these handy dandy formulas, which I have been using. And you did use on your last homework, I assume. <laughs> so I did grade that in homework, I'm going to give it back. Okay. And then what, what else? So I need a CJJ in here, right? Okay. So that's what the deletion fit for the beta J is. That's the measure, okay? And that's a unitless. The number of standard errors that beta j hat will change when the ith observation is deleted. Okay, we want to see if that changes much. Uh, we we had a glimpse of this last time. Even Cook's D won't tell you. Cook's D tells you on an average sense how much the whole vector beta hat changes. There are p components to the vector beta hat. We didn't see much of that changing, uh, but here you will see something. Now, what's a formula for this thing? 
we have. So how you actually compute this on the Excel worksheet? Well, I mean, you can, you can do it because you have a formula for SI squared. So you could, uh, you could find the column there and you have the uh, formula for CJJ. But there's kind of a nice way to do it because you don't have a formula for this ready yet. So I need to write that down. What's beta J hat minus beta J hat deleted I? All right? The deletion business. We have beta as a vector, beta hat P by 1 minus beta hat sub I P by 1. Okay? This is equal, this is by appendix C8. And it would be fun to go through the appendices, it really would. Uh, go through some of these calculations, including the, the distribution theory. This is RJI. No, it's not for this yet, I'm sorry. Of course, I need a formula for this. This is equal to x prime x inverse times this column, x1, xi1 down to xik. Um, That's a p by 1 column, right? p by 1 column. And then times the scalar ei over 1 minus hii. This is the very nice formula. It would take some work to go through. Okay? And ei is the residual? ei the is simply model. the residual from the full model. Okay, HII is the diagonal entry of the hat matrix, H matrix or hat matrix, the projection matrix that we talked about from day one here. Okay, so what does this give? This gives, therefore, now let's put in therefore that, um, suppose I now define, define, now, capital R equals X prime X inverse times X prime. Notice that this column here is a column of X prime, is it not? It is the ith column of X prime. X prime is uh, P by N. Okay, x is n by p, x prime is p by n, and this is the ith column of x prime. Okay, that's what that is right there. So if I wanted to find, uh, this altogether is a um, p by 1, if I wanted to find uh, and so this is this is a p by n. This is p by n altogether. And so what's going to happen now? Um, if I want to find uh, beta j hat minus beta j hat with deleted i index, okay. What I want to do is I want to go down to the j row level of this matrix, okay, and pull it out. But this is with the ith column of the x prime matrix. So I can get all of these at once in a formula by saying this is R sub J I times this E I over 1 minus H I I. He calls it little r sub J I. Okay? Well, I'm just calling this as uh, R J I. Okay? All right, so that's a p by n, and so that's a big matrix to the sideways. And then I want to make it tall, so r prime is the one I want. But okay, let's look at that. So that's true. Um, and then I have to put in this other business, right? So therefore, I'll notice also that r prime r. Notice this comes makes it uh, an alternative way to calculate. Um, these DF betas. I already have the CJJ from the X prime X inverse, so I can actually have this. But notice that uh, that R prime R is what R prime R 
is now r is p by n, so r prime is n by p. I'm sorry. Do I have this wrong? <clears throat> r prime Is this correct? Let's see. This is J. This has, uh, yeah. Something's bugging me about this. We want to call this R prime. Um, I must have this wrong. I must want to call this R prime. Uh, they call it R exactly as you have it. Did they? Yeah. Okay. 14. Okay. Okay. That's let's see. That's a p by n matrix. Okay. And so the j's were okay. So I have that. Um, and he's got a little problem with his notation there. Um, I'll show you. Let's see. Let's look in the appendix here. Just want to get this right thing. R prime r is n by n, but it's r r prime that I think I want. R r prime. That's what I want. R r prime. Okay, is therefore equal to, uh, I'm sorry, this is R. Is this right? R, R prime. I guess R, R prime is okay. X prime, X inverse times X prime. R prime will be before X times X prime, X inverse. Again, in the reverse order. So this comes out to be X prime, X inverse. Okay, which is a C matrix. Therefore, um, okay, so the diagonal element, so R R prime, the diagonal element of of R R prime is C J J. Okay, so therefore, let's see. I forgot exactly how he calls this little vector R J. I think he's calling R J. Um, so he's calling. So this is R J, and if he calls little R J with a bold sign on it, equal to what? That's going to be. Um, this, this, I can write this down as, um, let's see, for each j it's a column, right? So this is p by n, no, 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 no. So it's, this is r0, 1 over to r0, n, r1, 1 over to r1, n, and r, k, n over to r, r, excuse me, r1, yeah, our k is 1 over to our k n. n is the c column index. This is p by n in this thing. So what is rj? Uh, that I'm going to make uh, n long. So rj is really going to be this, uh, the j throw vector, rj1 over to rjn, okay, in this, in this r. Okay, so that's what rj is as a vector. Okay, and then the inner product of that vector with itself is CJJ. So I'll just put it this way, RJ, RJ, <laughs> okay, equals the summation RJI squared, I goes from 1 to N, that's equal to CJJ. RJ are column vectors? No, row vectors. Yeah, I'm thinking of the row vector. Here, that's the way we've got it set up. Uh, he doesn't. He doesn't actually say what R J is. R. He doesn't say. We'll see. If R J prime denote the jth row, he puts a prime on it. But then in his formulas, he drops the prime. Okay. So he's calling this R J prime in the notes. Okay. In the book, he called because he doesn't. He can't stand calling a row vector anything but a prime. Okay. It's kind of a prime. Okay. So that's how it is. So he leaves off a prime in his formula. It's 6, 8. It should be RJ prime. So what he's got in formula 6, 8, it should be written this way. 6, 8 should be written uh, DF beta JI equal to RJI, the I, JI index, uh, entry of this capital R matrix over the square root of RJ prime RJ, which is the CJJ underneath there, okay? And then I've got 
uh, EI over SI and then 1 minus HII. Okay, but this is a close thing to the uh, R student residual, right? That's close. R student is with the square root of 1 minus HII in it. Okay, so this can be rewritten as RJI over the square root of RJ prime RJ uh, TI. TI is a notation for R student divided by the square root of 1 minus HII. Okay, so that's just recalling what our student is. Our student was similar, similar to the studentized residual, where you just divided by the um, standard error of EI. Okay, except now we take the deleted version of the uh, sigma hat in place of the sigma hat. So you had, remember, RI was EI divided by the square root of 1 minus HII. Okay, with the sigma hat here. Okay, that's, a, that's the taking EI and divide by its standard error. Okay, and the TI, this was the studentized. And the TI was EI divided by, it's the same thing. In fact, you saw that our student is not very much different than the studentized residual, except you replace sigma hat by the S sub I here. Okay. So all you're doing is taking the deleted version of the standard error of EI. Okay. So these DF betas is how much, this, how many standard errors the thing is, the object is changing by. Okay. We do a similar thing with the deleted fit for fits. Okay. We mentioned that. All right. So this is the formula for 6A for DF. So let's just see, how do I actually do that? I'm going to calculate the R matrix. And I'm not even going to calculate the X prime X inverse to do this problem. So let's have a look. Let's look at uh, the wind data. Okay. Yes. Front lights too. Okay. This will be the last thing before we take a break, I guess. Okay, 6.12. What well, we did, okay. Okay. So how did I do this? R is C times X prime. Okay, R prime is X times C. And R, R prime is C. I've got the formulas right up here. Okay. Now, what is this RP? This RP is R, the zeroth column of R prime. So I should really put this as R prime. Make the, the zeroth column of R prime. Okay, R prime sub one. So maybe that's a little bit clearer notation. I didn't put it, I didn't change it on the website though. But I'll just change it here. So maybe you'll under, remember how that's going. Okay? Alright, those are the six columns of R prime. So R prime, let's see. This was R. R prime, so it, this is it's flat and long this way. Okay? All right, because it's n columns. R prime is going to be this way, All right? So actually, what this is is this is the R prime matrix right here. Okay, so what is that? R prime is x times c. So I did actually I did have to calculate the inverse of c. But that's how I did it. So I calculated to see the inverse somewhere. I'm not sure where I put it. Uh, maybe I put it on a different sheet that I erased. That is, that, that is crazy normal probability plot. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, it's pretty weird. Okay. Um, so, um, what did I do then? What did I take these sum of squares of these columns? So, so you see what I did? I take the five, the six columns. Of, that's not that hard to do, right? You just need to do the matrix multiplication and paste it in there. Okay. 
Then I take the sum of the squares. So those are the CJJs. So those both actually did have. This should be. Uh, I should be verifying. I should be able to get the the X matrix. So where's the X matrix? Let's go ahead and get the X matrix in here. Um, I mean the C matrix. Here's the intercept plus all the way through oakiness. I just want those. That's my X, right? The way Shane taught us how to do this thing. So if I ta now take the, uh, let's find a space for the C matrix. I need a six by six matrix, right? Where's room for that? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Equals. I just do it all in one shot. Equals M inverse of M mult what? Transpose X comma X. Should that do it? Okay, so that those are the diagonal entries. Are those are the same numbers that I've got over here? They better be. Uh, where are they? 3.69, 2.227, 0. Point, well, this is just not a big enough entry to see. That's rounded off. Okay, 0. 0.0549 and so on. Okay, so these are exactly the CJJs. By taking the, I mean, our linear algebra holds true. That's all. Okay, so um, we have. Um, can't see the top of this thing very well. Anyway, there's the R prime matrix sitting there. Okay, so R J I. So how did I calculate the D, the D F beta? This is just this number right here. T five is T five right here, right? T five divided by the square root of this C J J, and then times the ti, which I already had written down over here, divided by the square root of 1 minus hii, which I also had to calculate. You did have to calculate the hiis. But mainly what I need, I need to get those rjis stuck in here. Okay? I could have divided by the square root of cjj. I could have put it to cjj somewhere in a little array anyway. But here they're just sitting at the bottom as sums of squares. That's the only thing that's different here. Okay? Uh, yeah, I don't know where I got those. Those probably I copied and pasted from a Maple document. I probably got the H's from Maple and then copied into an Excel because I didn't. I still haven't deciphered how to do it in uh, Excel yet. Okay, I did get your email, Joe, but I haven't. We'll we'll do that as a pet project over the weekend. We'll see if we can figure out how to do the HII matrix, and then we'll uh, report it. Yes, we know how to do the HII, but how to do the diagonal. How to extract it from yeah. the diagonal? Yeah, yeah. how to extract the diagonal. Do you have a road to macro for it. Yeah. All right, why don't you enlighten us then? Well, I'll send it to you because it's easier to, like, Is, uh, Can you do it with a few commands rather than a macro? No, it's not easy. Okay. Um, but I'll Those people claim that it is. Okay. There's some other people, so we'll, we'll report that to you. Maybe we should forward the email to you. <laughs> okay. Did you get my email? Okay. All right. Other questions about this? Okay. So let's have a look at the DF betas. The cutoff suggested in the um, text that was published uh, by some authors was 2 over the square root of n. That's a unitless quantity. All right. So if the, if the absolute value of the, this number of standard errors that the beta j is changing by is more than that, and that's uniform over all j, then um, That's the point of high variability or high influence. Yeah, then you consider the 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 um, I thought observation influential, okay, for that particular beta. So here, for example, on observation number twelve, I think it was, um, we had these three influential. I mean, the, the observation twelve was influential on the first three betas, okay, and then it was influential on the last five betas for observation number 20. Observation number 20 had a large um, defits as well. Deletion uh, fit for fits. Which I recall was defined by uh, how much the predicted value changes in its number of standard errors. So the predicted value has 
uh, standard error sigma hat times the square root of HII. So, the, so D, D, deletion fit for fits I was equal to Y I hat minus Y hat sub I, uh, well, as a vector, okay, with this sub I. So I need another index, okay. So the uh, oh, I guess I'm doing it this way. I guess I'm putting it this way. Y I I at I. Okay, I'm deleting the ith observation. This is actually a whole vector. Okay, we talked about last time. Y hat sub I. You would estimate. You would delete the ith observation and predict at the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, all the way up to the nth observation what the actual uh, value of y would be, okay? So if we, if we think of that as a vector, then I need another index, okay? So it's the ith prediction with the ith removal, okay? Divided by the square root of hii and then with this uh, si here. Okay, that's what this is. And if that was bigger than uh, two times the square root of p over n. That was the cutoff, suggested cutoff, two times the square root of p over n. Then you had uh, large influence, okay? So you had large influence in this observation. Uh, not a big residual, okay? But many of the betas changed. Even though the Cook's D was only 0.3 instead of one, okay? All right, so that seemed to be an influential observation. Observation number 12 was somewhat influential. And there was some other minor influence down here. This had a fairly large, uh, well, there was a large HII. We also flagged the leverage points, okay? There seemed to be much less influence um, from observation number um, 37 or whatever it was, yeah. Okay. So anyway, we just flagged all the cutoffs, okay? You can examine some of those points or you just say, well, I'm tired. Just look at the main ones, <laughs> okay? <laughs> All right? So we didn't say what to do. Just examine and see what's going on and study them a little bit more, okay? Study the, I mean, you have to be intimately familiar with uh, wine quality processes and so on to really make educated statements about uh, what's going on here. I don't know anything about those regressors or about wine quality, okay? Again, in this exercise, uh, the region, which was, uh, which is going to be talked about in Chapter 8, we'll bring in that the uh, region as another regressor there, okay? We didn't use that here. Okay, why don't we take a break, and we'll come up after the break and start talking about uh, polynomial regression. Okay. Mm -hmm.